Yeah. So uh, this is Catherine, and she got a PhD in geographical science at the University of Maryland. Her doctorate research was aimed to highlight the consequences of drought on land use and on the lives of Northeast than Ugandans. It was also the first step in forming the basis of the remote sensing element of the disaster risk financing projects. This has supported uh, 75,000 households in the region. Uh, let me just uh, check that box. There we go. Uh, since 2017, so she's the Africa Program Director in the NASA Harvest Program, which I think sounds very cool indeed. And she's known for her work using remote sensing and machine learning technology to support the development of agriculture and food security across Africa, which sounds brilliant. And she's pioneered the research set the remote sensing by unmanned aerial vehicles in surveying refugee settlements and landslide mapping in Uganda, conducted research in remote sensing of drought and agriculture, and leading the integration of earth observations and agricultural monitoring of smallholder agriculture in multiple countries. Catherine, the problem with reading a bio like that is you reflect on how little I've done really in my life. But what a remarkable uh, bio, and it's a lot of that was, was obtained off Wikipedia as well. So it, it's amazing to see speakers that we have here with their own Wikipedia pages. Uh, welcome, Catherine. How are you? I'm doing okay. How are you? Good. Very, very good. Thank you so much for joining us. Hopefully, everybody's calm and in bed on your side. Yeah. <laughs> but if they're not, we'll say hello to them. Yeah, I think they're fine now. Wonderful. We're, we're on 1751. We're going to close at 1830, but we'll use as much time as that as, as you need um, for your presentation and questions. Um, the stage is yours, and thank you so much again for coming to join us tonight. Um, thank you so much, uh, Richard, and for that uh, a pretty good introduction. Actually, I might copy that text and put it on my bio. Um, it was really comprehensive and, 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 and really kind. I'm also you know, overwhelmed, uh, you know, speaking after Gilberto uh, and uh, having worked, of course, uh, my work contributes to GEO primarily through um, GEOGLAM, which is the group on Earth Observations Global Culture Monitoring Initiative, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. But then also, um, of, of course, following Gregor and, uh, and the work that he's done on, in the Sentinel Hub, which is, you know, one of those things that has opened up Earth Observations to a much broader community, which I think is is really important. So I think my presentation touches on a few things that are a bit technical, but um, it kind of gives some examples of how we're applying it into agriculture. Um, a lot of people are, are not familiar with the use of uh, machine learning in agriculture and how satellites relate to, to crop and crop monitoring. So, um, I will kind of touch on that a little bit, but um, it also kind of builds on um, what um, Gilberto and, uh, and Gregor have also shown and some of the slides are actually pretty pretty similar. So we might've copied each other like this, this particular one I think was in uh, this, the image on the right was in uh, uh, Gilberto's presentation. I just like to show it because uh, um, you know, there are lots of land monitoring systems that are orbiting the earth every day. So building into Gregor's presentation, we have a lot of data that we can do a lot, a lot more things and we can make much better decisions for our planet. Um, and this is also very close to what, uh, to the first slide in, in Gilberto's. I like to show this and I'll relate it to agriculture a little bit is that um, we have satellites orbiting the earth. Uh, they're providing daily, in the case of MODIS, like Greg has said, um, the data is timely and objective. Objective is really important because a lot of decisions uh, are made and some of them are not based on data. Some of them are not objective, uh, but based on feelings or thoughts of, you know, or policies and, and stuff like that. So uh, going back to Gilberto's point about science, I think uh, we now have data that we can use everywhere, uh, pretty much monitor the entire earth, you know, forest, water, um, and others, and other, and other things. And this was also, I think, in Gilberto's, but I show it because um, 
having this data set has meant a lot for agriculture monitoring. So we can uh, look at crop conditions across the entire globe and compare it, for example, when you, we're using the MOTIS satellite, the last, um, the last 20 years since uh, 2020, 2000, to, since the year 2000. This means a lot because I can, you know, it also helps in explaining what the data means. So if someone is familiar with a, a certain time period where there was a very bad drought, the example for where I did my PhD, um, you could tell them that, well, this year compares to that year in less way. So things are much worse or much better, uh, or they're about the same as, 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 you know, the worst year on record. And this is one of my favorite is that, uh, Yes, the data global in, in some instances, or in most cases now even have daily three meter resolution data from uh, Planet Labs. Um, and we can use those data to monitor different landscapes. Uh, Gregor hinted on this as well. And um, so it's, it's available to everybody. We can, you can, we can track different agriculture practices. We have irrigation here. We have a lot of these smallholder fields. Um, we have much larger fields. These are uh, in the US, for example. Uh, but we can use the same data, the same methodology, um, you know, with a lot of training data, which has also been mentioned, uh, we can get to some insight. So we can come from basically knowing nothing about an area. If you've never been there, of course, if you're from there, you have a good idea. In most cases, I've, from my experience working in the field, farmers know a lot about what's going on in their field and in their neighborhood than anybody else. But um, if you're a policy person, in most cases, um, you're far removed from what's going on on the ground. Um, low cost, some of what Greg has, uh, has shown makes it possible for, you know, countries that might not have a lot of, um, can you hear me? I hope so. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, sorry. Um, so countries that might not have a lot of uh, infrastructure or um, data tools can take advantage of so many things that are readily available. So there's uh, open data, open APIs. Uh, you can integrate those data workflows. Uh, Gregor showed some, you know, uh, scripts and stuff that you can use to make analyses and make it usable within, you know, your own organization. And that's really fantastic. And of course, uh, with machine learning, we're able to now go through these petabytes and petabytes of data and make some sense of it, as well as um, do things that... Um, sometimes might take a lot longer. Uh, and now we have uh, cloud computing, uh, GPUs and stuff, which make it possible to run, you know, entire countries in a, in a number of days rather than before where um, you would have to, for example, download a Landsat image. With, if you're in Africa, that might take a couple of days with internet interruption might never happen. Um, and then if you needed the whole country, then, you know, that's a whole other uh, thing, so. But all of that said, however, um, many African countries uh, basically every year, um, this is an example from 2020, it doesn't cover all the events that happen across Sub-Saharan Africa, East and Southern Africa, but we have uh, continuous droughts, cyclones, uh, we have flooding and landslides, crop failure, heavy rainfall floods. We had the locust invasion that's still ongoing, a one in seven year event. We have more cyclones and then this was all before uh, COVID-19. Um, yet all of these things with the satellite data we have, we could, you know, we could, most of them were forecast, um, you know, that there's basically data that could have, you know, provided early warning in these instances. So um, I like this one because um, I think it's good to have goals and we can measure how, we're, how, how we're, you know, how far, how well we're doing. And Personally, and I think a lot of data will, will suggest the same, we're really far away from SDG number two because there are more people who are, you know, who are going hungry, um, add all the, you know, the, the, the impacts of COVID-19. Uh, there are just many, many more people. There's more conflict, uh, more people in the face, you know, of, of natural, natural, uh, um, of man-made disasters, I guess, in most cases. Um, but technologically, there are some things that we can do. There are data and tools that can give us more insight and we can do things a little bit better that can support increasing production, productivity, uh, determining um, what needs to grow where, how we can grow better, where we need facilities to improve storage and uh, increase farmers' incomes. 
So um, I would just introduce the uh, NASA Harvest Program, which is um, uh, NASA's agriculture and food security uh, program. And a main goal is advancing and enabling the use of Earth observations to benefit food security and agriculture and um, human and environmental resilience. It's run out of the University of Maryland. And in this program, I'm the Africa program lead. Um, what that really means is that I, um, I coordinate and, and manage and, and try to keep track of all the work that we're doing in Africa in a way that is um, complementary and also uh, sustainable and also yields you know tangible outcomes for uh, our partners and so um, so I, I did introduce harvest um, the umbrella of the work that we do is under the group on earth observations global culture monitoring initiative that I mentioned initially and um, I'm uh, I also work uh, under the NASA severe program which is NASA's um, uh, it's, a, it's a capacity building program and it's a joint initiative with the uh, uh, US Agency for International Development. The idea is that there are tools and methods that have been developed that work really, really well and can be co-developed further into countries that um, might not necessarily have the infrastructure uh, or, or human resource and that, you know, we try to uh, work on, on those things together and address those gaps. So Harvest ha Africa, I like this because it kind of gives an, an overview of what we're doing. We're combining satellite imagery um, and ground data, um, you know, with uh, time series data. Uh, we use a lot of deep learning analysis, uh, machine learning analysis and produce products like cropland, crop type, crop conditions, yield modeling that is relevant for policy, but as well as can be, can, can inform and enable, you know, what, what farmers do, um, which is kind of a, a much, much uh, further step. So our priorities are improving early warning systems, advancing methods that underpin the, the, those data, the, the data systems and the, the, and developing and transferring capacity into national and local users, as well as um, developing strong and long-term sustainable partnerships, which is important for making things, make sure things work. So going back to those things, um, I've been doing a lot of capacity training in uh, Eastern and in West Africa uh, on using uh, the GeoGlam crop monitor system for monitoring agriculture. Um, we have a GLAM system, which is a global culture monitoring system, which you can, you know, look at crop conditions across the entire globe uh, for the last 20 years. Uh, you can look at indices like the Normalized Difference uh, Water Index and DWI for, which is, um, you know, a, one way to look at drought. Uh, we're integrating EO into other data sets. And for example, this is a like a COVID dashboard, which tries to understand cases and food security and trying to understand, you know, how things might evolve in terms of food access, for example. And then we have uh, one of our partners, um, uh, UC Santa Barbara, uh, developed the Early Warning Explorer, which you can look at temperature and rainfall as well as uh, get forecast data, which is important and relevant for, um, for monitoring. Uh, crop conditions. Uh, just some examples, all these systems are global, so you can zoom in anywhere and track how things are going. It's an example for Mali, an example for Uganda. Um, this is an example, I think this is also for, for Uganda and then it's also Mali. Um, what this has resulted in just having access to the systems and through the capacity uh, development uh, uh, programs that I've kind of led trainings and stuff. Uh, the establishment of these crop monitor. The, these two are global systems developed initially uh, under GeoGlam to monitor crop conditions in bigger producer countries that might influence global food prices. And then we have a crop monitor for early warning, focusing on countries that are at risk of food insecurity. And then um, I led the development of the Eastern Africa crop monitor, which monitors uh, 11 countries in East Africa and then led uh, the establishment of uh, the Rwanda, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and uh, Mali crop monitors. So we can kind of look at crop conditions across all of these countries, um, you know, using the same methodology and the same approach and kind of the similar data input, but allows for input of other data that are available to our partners. So um, small monitoring smallholder agriculture is incredibly tough. And this is where uh, machine learning comes in um, really, 
you know, it's basically changing the things that we can do and how quickly we can do them. So just these pictures, just kind of give you an example. This is an example of, a, uh, I think this is from Planet Imagery for Mali. You can see these uh, actually crop fields, but they have trees in them. Every dot that you see in this picture, these dark green dots are um, like this big tree right here. And then this is sorghum in the foreground. Uh, this is a photograph from Kenya, from Transoya. Uh, on the bottom, there are beans, and this is uh, maize. This is a photograph from um, Morogoro, from Jombe in Tanzania, and we have mostly pure maize. Uh, but it's if you when we're driving around and and and, and the, the crops were in different stages. Um, some are not grown in in rows, so it's sometimes difficult to kind of understand what crop is growing. And in monitoring agriculture, you need to be able to understand what crops are growing where and how well those crops are doing and how the, you know, what the, you know, the end result will be at the end of the season. And so there are huge challenges for using machine learning when you, you know, machine learning uh, and earth observations for agriculture and even more challenges when you look at smallholder agriculture. So there's, you know, high interclass variance, uh, low interclass variance. We have very few labels. Um, and one of the, you know, one of the, one of the, the biggest, I guess, one of a recent grant that I am um, going to be leading is focusing on trying to address uh, um, data gaps in terms of labels. So, you know, we don't have enough labels to be able to to map, for example, you know, crop types. Like this is an example of uh, a field where you have uh, maize. I haven't quite figured out what this is right here in the front. So we're experimenting with having um, um, windshield surveys. This was done in Kenya last uh, this past, uh, past, the past few months, I think in November, and you have bananas here. So if you were to, you know, you could use machine learning to segment this field, but then you need to be able to, be able to determine the distance from the road. You need to be able to uh, determine like where that, that, you know, what falls, uh, where the maze falls in the pixel to be able to actually use it as a, a label for training. And then this, this is one, uh, I'm right there in the back in pink in, in Karmoja, uh, one of the things why it's really, really important to do this is that um, we lost track of your slides, Catherine. I'm just wondering. Oh, I have no idea where you are. Uh, you're situated what are you situated at the back seeing? of the pink, and this. Oh, right there, all the way. I'm in the back, right here. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> sorry for interruption. Uh, I'm right there, like right there. Uh, but this photograph here is just showing, you know, uh, a farmer had planted their crop and it failed. It's mixed sorghum with sunflower, and this is the month of August when it's supposed to be harvested. So you know, it's it's really it's really important that we keep track of these things to be able to provide information relevant for decision making. Anyways, so some of the things that we're trying to do, as I mentioned, um, with uh, we have a Lacuna Fund grant on um, looking at collecting labor data, particularly focusing on crop type is we, uh, we want to use these images to complement existing labels. Gregor mentioned this, that you know, if you have training labels from anywhere, you can use those to, and apply them somewhere else. And so we've been doing a lot of that using this GeoWiki de Geo dataset, which is a, 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 you know, a crowdsource crop labels. Um, I've, I've participated in the GeoWiki well, when we're working in, in Tanzania. And this has become really handy. And then we try and complement that with some hand labeling. So we go in and, you know, classify and, and basically digitize, you know, that this is crop and this is not crop. And this is, you know, this is, um, but we need crop labels, which actually are really expensive because there's no way you can determine whether this plot here is maize, sorghum or, or, or millet or banana. Except of course, if it's very high resolution, then you could say that it's not maize and it is banana. Uh, but you couldn't still be able to distinguish between maize and sorghum. They look very similar. Um, and so some of our uh, most recent work and the papers are here, the data uh, are published as well as the, the algorithms and the training and the training data. Um, and we basically, uh, in earlier in 2020, at the beginning of lockdown, we did one for uh, Togo 
And then closer to the end, we completed a, a, a crop land, a crop probability map for Kenya, as well as we tried to do one in season one. In season means that we did it before we had the full time series for, for Kenya, which kind of test the, the feasibility of providing data in season. In season is important because you want to be able to provide early warning uh, in, you know, to inform response programs. I'm gonna go a little bit faster so I can finish and we can have time for questions and discussion. Uh, we're also using machine learning for modeling yield, um, you know, combining uh, different EO data sets. Uh, this is an example of, of a recent output from a, a model called GeoCIF. This output here is uh, just a random forest um, um, output as it compares to historical yield reported in, um, in, in Kenya, and we're doing it at the sub, uh, sub national level. Um, but we, you know, there are all of these other indicators that kind of give us an idea of what's happening uh, in a particular region. And we have it globally. So there's an example for, for the US, but we have these data and this outputs for, um, for Kenya as well, combining, you know, the normalized vegetation index telling you how green things are, which is how healthy crops are, and then everything from temperature, rainfall, um, and others. So some impact examples, I'll go really quickly. Uh, this one is from, 20, from, from 2020, as I mentioned, for Togo. The request was they, were, they have a, a program called YOLIM, and what they wanted was to know where farmers were because of lockdown. You know, they were unable to reach a lot of them, but then they needed to understand where farmers were located. So uh, within 10 days, the, 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 a combination of uh, using the GeoWiki data set as well as hand labeling from our team, uh, yielded a 2019 uh, cropland map for Togo, and we hope to do this a little bit further and, you know, do uh, crop specific maps. We have, we had support from uh, Planet Labs team providing us with a high resolution uh, mosaic for, um, for Togo that we're able to use to, you know, distinguish crop, non-crop, because there wasn't a lot of uh, Google Earth Pro imagery, high resolution imagery for Togo for 2019. Um, so this is kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's great. It, we made it, we made it, we made it possible. We used a lot of innovation and, and, and I would say, you know, addressing the fact that there were no labels whatsoever for Togo when we started and were able to do this, I think is, is really important. And we want, we work with these opportunities to, you know, to do a bit more work within, um, you know, our, our partners, like for example, in Togo, in this case, I already talked about um, this, but, what we want to do uh, a lot further is have um, the products, these products up, up, you know, a part of a, we have had a long relationship with the Kenya Ministry of Agriculture through capacity building, which led to the re realization of, you know, the, not the, I mean, it was pretty obvious, like there, there's a lack of uh, having timely, consistent uh, data that is required for them assessing their own programs. And so we want to create pipelines where um, it will be possible for them to rerun these models, um, you know, updating uh, training labels where, whenever possible and uh, using this data to inform, um, for example, their the insurance program, which is uh, something that we're doing under uh, an activity funded by the Swiss Re Foundation. So just EO as EO uh, using time series of uh, MODIS NDVI. Um, Richard mentioned this in, in my bio. Um, I guess this is one of the reasons why I, I, I received that Africa Food Prize, but um, we're able to just use those data and characterize drought in, in the Karamoja region and use it to inform this disaster risk financing program. So these images here, uh, just show like kind of the, uh, the analyses that the department, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture does. And this, and this lady here's name, her name is Stella. She's the coordinator for that program. And they do it all fully in-house. We don't, we're not involved anymore. They just, you know, do the analyses and, and provide their, do their own reports and uh, implement the projects in the region. This is my favorite because it was one of those first moments when I realized that, you know, there is promise from what I'm doing. Uh, the time when I went, when the, the photograph I showed when I was in the pink shirt, which is my most, I guess, famous shirt uh, I have, um, is that I wrote a report right after that field work that I did, and my report was presented in the office of the prime minister, and it led to dispatching food aid, like, the, the, the day after, because I provided, you know, 
evidence about what was going on in the larger region and there was no doubt that there was a drought and things were going to get worse. Um, but what is interesting is that, you know, the system has existed for a really long time and it could have been used further and further. And so we're working towards making sure that other countries can have access to these tools as they can build more complex and more, you know, better, better programs or uh, take advantage of, you know, machine learning things. So this is kind of my summary slide, um, having access to uh, earth observations and functioning well-tested uh, global systems like these two appear at the top with, you know, tools like ODK, uh, which I use a lot for ground data collection. Um, it is, you know, and combining, of course, the, the satellite imagery with machine learning uh, models using applications like Google Earth Engine or Sentinel Hub. Um, is, is fantastic, but what is what I found as the most impactful has been bringing those tools into processes and departments and ministries that want to use these tools, as well as, you know, partner organizations that might work directly with farmers uh, and trying to make sure that those things are integrated into policies and programs, both at national and global level and, and you know, demonstrating their usefulness for measuring and understanding what's going on. Um, you know, is I think what drives impact and, and you know, changes within institutions that uh, countries like uh, Uganda and Tanzania and Kenya, as well as the, as well as, uh, um, the EGAD Climate Predictions and Application Center, continue to use these tools and as they evolve um, and, and acquire and use more data and more robust models, it becomes, um, it becomes pretty straightforward because of the relationship that uh, we've established. And, that's all I had for today. Thank you. Oh, I should say something about this photograph. This photograph is a lady in uh, in uh, Njombe in Tanzania from about 2015. It's my favorite photograph uh, because um, she was a farmer and we wanted to identify maize fields in, um, in, in the region that we could go and kind of pilot some ground data collection. So the measurements that you saw in one of the pictures earlier and she was like well that's maize this is this one's field and I was just completely blown away so you know farmers can learn to use these, these tools and it's you know it's, it's really fantastic so I'll stop there thank you thanks thanks Catherine uh, I, I can't thank you enough you know your talk has been so wonderful and I'm, I'm sure it's inspiring as well uh, hearing about your geoglam program the NASA harvest etc and and I think uh, this is what all the three talks say that we do have the satellite images available there is high resolution data available there are GPUs to process it and uh, with the help of machine learning the EO data can be you know analyzed well but because of the labeling problems uh, that we are facing and the ecosystem which changes on its own. There are difficulties into the robustness of those models. But uh, uh, with the kind of data that you have been collecting and the expertise that you have at the local level, definitely you're able to build in, you know, ground level agricultural monitoring systems. And this is helping uh, the farmers, not just the farmers, but the entire food chain and, uh, you know, uh, be it agriculture or the security, the policies, etc. And this is having a timely and, a, you know, life-saving impact, I will say, that is more important because you're directly reaching out to the farmers with these systems. And when there are natural disasters, etc., uh, you know, they're able to use the outcomes of machine learning and the EO data that we have, uh, that is more important. So there is an advancement that we are seeing with, of course, the challenges being a part of it. But I think uh, you have done a great job, uh, you know, uh, absolutely reaching at the ground level. And, uh, you know, uh, this is great. Thanks, thanks, Catherine. And uh, uh, I'm really thankful uh, to talk to you. Uh, and I'll just uh, give, give out some uh, questions uh, onto that. Uh, Catherine, uh, just a moment. So uh, is there any impact on your research due to global warming? And are we running out of food in near future? This is just out of curiosity, but this has come as a question. Yeah, um, I mean, ultimately, so 
when you when you're down in the field, of course we can see this. We can see the you know the the variability in the fields if we're looking at if we're looking at the data. But if you go down to the field too, farmers will tell you things have changed. You know, uh, the season starts late. Uh, we don't know. You know, it rains for two days and it stops. I plant my seeds. I've lost the season, the past season. So yes, um, uh, but I think the other thing is that. Um, the way we're producing food, I think, is is flawed. That um, we have enough land, we're using enough land to be able to produce enough for everybody. But what is required to make agriculture more productive uh, um, is not um, is in some places and not others. So farmers, you know, who could feed an entire, you know, one farmer in some countries could feed an entire village. This is not true in in, in a lot of smallholder. You know, it has to be everybody has to grow something. And so, you know, they, they'll get 20% of their investment back in, in, in that sense. And so, you know, this is where the, this is where we can make a very big difference, like getting farmers what they need to use the land that they're already using. Um, otherwise, you know, a lot of places, there's more and more expansion into forests and grasslands, and this is creating a much, much, much bigger problem. And if, if that's not addressed, of, you know, expansion will continue. One of the places I did my first field work in, in Mount Elgon, when I went there 10 years ago, you know, it was just perfect, but there was a lot of issues. But then I went back in 2019 and you can see, if you can see it on the satellite imagery itself, there's a clear boundary that has been shifting consistently into the forest. So people can grow crops further and further up and um, this cannot continue. So um, if we don't address that, we will not have any functioning ecosystem um, and we will definitely run out of food um, for a larger chunk of the population. You know, the 100 and, is it 185 million people who are likely to, you know, you know, be pushed further into food insecurity this year, that's gonna get bigger and bigger. Uh, and then we have, of course, other issues, conflict, you know, there's, there's studies showing relationship between uh, food insecurity and conflict. And uh, it's just, you know, I think humans have data and information to really treat this earth a lot better, but um, there's a lot of inaction and not enough of the right action, I think. It's like scientists are screaming in a vacuum and that's really a big problem. Thanks, thanks, Catherine. There's another uh, question as well from Neeraj. Uh, uh, what, uh, thanks for sharing such an insightful presentation, Catherine. The work you're doing is commendable. What's the major challenge you face? Is it related to technology, data processing, data access, applications or fun funding or anything else? Well, definitely funding. I would say there is a lot of interest uh, for countries to just use the very basic already existing tools. Um, they're ready, they want to get going and, you know, we have to prepare training material, you know, we, we, we have such a small team for the work that we have done really and I would say that uh, we need a lot more help but we need also collaborations, I mean we don't have to have all the funding, we just have to have really good partners and, 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 and you know, we're like the consortium we have is more than 40 partners and it's for a good reason, it's because we can't do everything. And we'd like to do it in a way that is transferable, sustainable, and can continue without a direct, you know, um, an, an integration. But I would say that um, there's not enough of us who are working towards getting the, the data and the tools into hands of institutions that actually influence millions of lives. So if you go uh, in uh, Ministry of Agriculture or Department of Food Security, you will find that they don't have, you know, functioning computers. There's no internet. There is no, so there's, there's like, you can't even begin to talk about using Google Earth Engine or uh, accessing the GLAM system and look at, you know, conditions. So there's also that, um, there's also a requirement that institutions recognize this and do something about it, you know, like there are tools that they can use to make things a lot better. Um, and, and I'm only, th I'm only speaking in, from my experience working in, in countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, so um, they really need, you know, to get a move on about, about this. 
Thanks. Thanks, Catherine. I hope uh, that answers the question. There's uh, one last question from Andy, and it is, does your work feed into helping aid policy from UK and US, for example, when crops are predicted to fail? So um, one of our uh, one of our partners uh, directly does this FuseNet. Uh, their uh, ultimate objective is to support programming for for USAID. Um, but uh, that said, we uh, are doing a few things uh, supported by uh, you know the U uh, USAID as well. And what we're trying to do is um, develop methodology for assessing some of their programs where it might be impossible to access ground data, like places that are in conflict. So we're trying to use machine learning, actually. This is a really good example of where machine learning is really important. So uh, in Mali, because of conflict, there are, only, there are so few places where you can go and collect data. So um, I've done some trainings in, in Segu. We've collected some data on the ground in Segu in, in Mali. Um, and there are others where you can go, but there are certain places where you can't go. So you would know nothing about what's going on in those areas. So what we're trying to do is use labels where we have them and, and um, you know, do cropland and crop type mapping that then can inform, you know, conditions assessment. So, yeah, um, we do, we do, you know, ultimately that should uh, influence some of the policies and some of the programs that they, that they implement. Thanks, thanks, Catherine, uh, and uh, really glad. I think I, uh, we have uh, covered all the questions, and uh, uh, you know, I'll be moving on to Richard, and uh, he can just take it from there. Thanks, thanks, Richard, and thanks, Catherine. I'm not sure why I'm getting thanked. I just sit here and watch the magic happen. But um, Diesel, thank you very much, um, Catherine. Just wonderful. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to so far, please do read some of the comments that came through as you're finishing your talk. Um, comments of appreciation, gratitude, and uh, congratulating you on, on the work you're doing. We're going to finish in about four minutes. Catherine, a quick one for me. Are you finding ways to empower women through your work? Yeah, so um, several ways, but... Um... One of the things that I like to do, uh, like when I'm on the ground ground, so they're like, you know, different levels, working with university students or uh, working with, uh, with, with farmers. When we do trainings for ground data collection, um, one time I asked that we make it 50-50, like 50% women, 50, they were like, you're crazy, that cannot happen. This is Molly. <laughs> Um, but so what I found interesting though, like that lady in Tanzania, she was just absolutely amazing. She knew everything about everything. Um, and just talking to her and, you know, and telling her about what I do kind of brought this, you know, this in mind. And I ran into another lady in, in, in the Karamoja region who just collects data. So I try to like continue to engage with them. I have, you know, since the, the food prize, I've uh, connected with a lot of people from, you know, different research groups or different organizations who we just have conversations about like, how do I, how would I pursue uh, a, a career in that direction? How do I learn? Where do I find information? So I've been trying to put together um, like resources of things where like students can begin and have, I want to have like a, a strategic way of, you know, providing uh, guidance in the direction of how they can access tools um, that I didn't even know existed, but you know because I've been doing this, I, I found out about them, um, and and do that. So um, also reaching out like different education partners and, and stuff like that, trying to build material that would be that would be really cool for for people to learn um, on their own. Um, because not everybody can you know go to a fancy university or access. Uh, Sometimes it's just they want to teach themselves something and then or um, they might be just stuck somewhere where they're not seeing where things will go. So one of the things my favorite thing to say to, to my nieces is stay in school. Uh, things will become clearer as you get older, but just keep trying to learn. And I think that's that one's like that is really important, uh, particularly when you grow up in a, when you don't have a lot of resources and access to things. 